Hi everyone! We were having some te technical difficulties on that post, so we are going to just do it from my phone. Uh, gotta go with it. Can you hold this for two seconds while Ooh, I post yeah. this? Oh yeah, just careful, that's the camera right there. And we're gonna post this on the post that you guys are all commenting on right now. Um, see, there we are, it's going now. Great. Um, we are live here. Great. I'll tag you, Dr. Michael. You're just under it's Michael Vitale, aren't you? All right. Great. All right. We are live now. Um. Hi, everybody. Here, we can hold it. I'll hold it like this. Actually, your, Hello, arm, your arm is probably longer than mine. Um, great, we're gonna get started now. So, hi everyone, I am Leah Stoltz. I'm the founder and president of Curvy Girl Scoliosis Foundation. Hi, I'm Michael Vitale. I'm the chief of pediatric spine and scoliosis here and also uh, the director of the Conservative Center for Scoliosis at Columbia University Medical Center. And we are really excited that Kirby Girls is bringing you our first ever live stream Q&A. And I think we're, we're hoping that we're going to make this a monthly thing, maybe invite some other guests on, talk with a bunch of other people. Um, but we're really excited that Dr. Vitali agreed to be our first ever guest. Thanks for inviting me. It's a real thrill. And it's really Thank looking you. forward to doing it together. And thanks, everyone, for putting up with our technical problems. But I think we're in good shape now. So. Looks like people are starting to join. Excellent. So I'm happy about that. For those of you who don't know much about Curvy Girls, Curvy Girls is an international support organization for girls between the ages of 9 to 22. We have close to 90 chapters all around the world in about 35 states and 14 countries as of right now. So I think it's very possible that people are tuning in from not only the East Coast, but the West Coast or other countries, hoping, you know, we have a lot of groups in Canada. So, hoping to have a lot of input from people all around the world. So, good evening to all everybody. Good morning. Good <laughs> afternoon. Um, I think we'll we'll get started. Um, so, my first question. I'll, I'll start with one of my questions. I would like to know what you think the importance of support is in. Um, a girl's journey with scoliosis. Yeah, I think it's a great question, and I think it's it's key actually to any sort of medical diagnosis, but also and in particular um, to something like scoliosis, where patient engagement, family engagement, compliance with therapy can um, really have a huge effect on outcomes. So, first of all, any diagnosis in a teenager is hard. You know, we sometimes say adolescent idiopathic scoliosis would be a lot easier to treat if it didn't happen to adolescents. It's a <laughs> tough time of life right. and people are changing and social pressures and, you know, the concept of yourself. And I think the, the power of knowing that you're not alone through the journey, that there are other people out there that, whether it's a crowded waiting room or an online community that, that uh, like yours, that you have so impressively co uh, created, has a huge impact on people's um, ability to not only get through it, but to uh, be part of the treatment, own the treatment, and ultimately to have a much better outcome as a result. What, one of the things that we know increasingly about scoliosis is that um, your choices make a difference. People who are compliant with treatment, compliant with physical therapy and bracing, have dramatically lower rates of curve progression. So engagement of the patient, of the family, and really the whole team um, with the family and the patient at the center is really key. Yeah, that's great. And I, I love that answer because I feel like that's a huge part of what Curvy Girls is. So I'm just pasting this video because I know some people are still looking for it. Um, so, let's see, let me mute this. Mm. Show the URL, there we go. All right, I'm pasting this to everybody who is on that other video that we were trying to get up and working. So just give me one second. Mm. 
Oh, it looks like it merged with this. So we're good. All right. Great. Something good is happening. I think we're good now. <laughs> Great. So um, I did see a few questions that came in right before um, we got started throughout the day. So I figure we'll start with some of those. And one of the questions I saw was about pain management. So what are some of your advice for, or tips about pain management um, post-surgery or pre-surgery when girls are having a tough time with their brace? First of all, uh, pain in um, adolescent people, um, back pain, is not that uncommon regardless of whether or not you have scoliosis. So I think that uh, the, 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 the core things, the important things are the basic things. Back pain has to do with keeping a, a strong core um, so that means exercises that support your abdominal muscles and your back muscles. The, the, the biggest two culprits for back pain in general in teenage people are backpacks. We know from well done epidemiological studies that when your backpack weighs more than about 7% of your body weight, um, you start having more uh, back pain. And the other thing is um, um, screen time. People who spend a lot of time in front of a screen have more uh, back pain. Generally speaking, uh, working with a physical therapist, particularly a scoliosis friendly, a scoliosis specific physical therapist can have a huge difference. That's great. So I did hear you say backpacks. I, I wanna just emphasize that because I think people have this like crazy misconception that backs, back, backpacks can cause scoliosis. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. And that's <laughs> right. Um, studies have also very clearly and convincingly demonstrated that backpacks do not cause scoliosis. They do not cause scoliosis progression. They are a common cause of back pain, but they don't cause scoliosis. Great, awesome. Um, I'm seeing a bunch of questions come in. I'm so excited about that. Uh, let's start with this first one I'm seeing. Can we talk about the importance of wearing the brace? Yeah, bracing is really key. We know from the landmark pivotal study that's called BRAIST, B-R-A-I-S-T. This is a randomized study funded by the National Institute of Health that showed that kids who have uh, who are compliant with bracing, kids who wear a well-made, well-functioning brace enough hours a day, and we can talk about what that means, have much, much, much lower rates of curve progression. Um, in fact, the study was terminated early by the NIH because they felt it was unethical to randomize kids to not bracing given the early results of the study. Since that study, people um, have come around and realized how important bracing is, and there's big, much more emphasis both on the details of bracing, like in-brace correction, balance within the brace, and uh, maybe even more importantly, compliance. Um, again, um, changing behavior is hard, and it really looks like we need to get into the brace at least 16 hours a day, if not more, um, for, for bracing to be successful. But in that subgroup of kids who are compliant, progression is much, much less likely. That's, a, that's great. Um, all right, let's... Go to this question right here, is physical therapy good? Yeah, we have a, um, a Center for Conservative Management of Scoliosis here with uh, several great sh uh, Schrock physical therapists. What the historically, and unfortunately, the, the, the historical idea here persists, physical therapy in the past was not necessarily shown to dramatically improve scoliosis. That was before Schrock physical therapy and scoliosis uh, specific physical therapy really made its entree into the United States. Now, with modern techniques of scoliosis-specific physical therapy, there are a number of really well-done studies showing that people who are compliant with physical therapy have much lower rates of, of, of progression. In fact, in a study done here at Columbia University, we showed that the subset of kids who really participated in Schroth over the long uh, run had much, much lower rates of progression than the rest of the kids. Bracing and scoliosis-specific physical therapy are two of the three staples that we consider the mainstay of conservative treatment of adolescent scoliosis. That's great. And for those of you who don't know, can you define, explain Schroff for us? Schroff is, um, is a school of scoliosis-specific physical therapy that aims to teach kids postural education, postural re-education, uh, sort, sort of as if you're standing in a braced position. It allows people to understand their curve and three-dimensionally correct their curve almost at a subconscious level. Mm -hmm. People who are really good at Schrapp can stand as if they are in a braced position even without a brace. And we think that especially during the period of rapid growth, that has a, a very important effect at stopping progression. In fact, four randomized studies have 
validated the effect of strong physical therapy. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I know that I personally, I, I you know, whenever I'm talking to a lot of surgeons from around the country, around the world, I, I mean, especially in the U.S., a lot of them are starting to are have doubted Shroth, and I, I think my experience, you know, I've been in the scoliosis community for 11 years now, um, is that people are more and more starting to recognize that how important Shroth is, um, and it's really cool. It's really awesome to see that change. It's amazing, and it's it's happened slowly. You know, um, I think that in American medicine, change comes slowly, and honestly, the medical community and surgeons, maybe in particular, are a little slow to embrace. Um, cutting edge, conservative, non-operative treatments, mm -hmm. I'm seeing this change so dramatically. And I have to give you guys tremendous credit for being part mm -hmm. of the change that's happening. Thank you. Um, <laughs> because um, this is one of the areas where the, the, the patient groups and the, the viral energy that you guys have created have pushed the rest of the community and dragged us all along. So it's slow coming, it's really important, and I would really urge you guys to seek out um, Shroff physical therapists and um, physicians in your community who um, are part of that care team and uh, and um, are aware of all the opportunities that are out there. That's awesome, and I saw a follow-up question to that, asking if this is only available in the U.S. Uh, I'm in Australia, but I, I think Shroth is all over the world. Is there a site that, do you, do you know of a site to go to to find a close Shroth therapist? We, we refer um, our patients to the Hunter Shroth Physical Therapy site. Um, Hagid Bertashevsky is one of the physical therapists that runs the Shroth um, certification program and I think that um, there are centers in lots of places around the world um, um, but it's still sort of spreading. Um. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, we have a question here. I'm wondering if you know of any research or any patients who have experience with chronic pain after surgery. Would a rod removal surgery help reduce pain? Oop, it jumped. Um, is it common for those with chronic pain to maybe have a secondary undiagnosed condition? Yeah, if you're having significant back pain after surgery, and I mean more than six weeks after surgery, um, and back pain that doesn't really respond to physical therapy, um, you really should be looking for another source of pain. It's really uncommon to have back pain after scoliosis surgery that persists. Um, and um, it would make me think if there's uh, something else going on. For example, spondylolysis is a weakness in the lower lumbar spine. That's the most common cause of back pain in teenagers, and that would be something I would be looking for with persistent back pain. I would be very slow to remove rods. In fact, in 16 or 17 years of doing this, I've never removed scoliosis really? rods, uh, wow. really for any reason whatsoever. So I would not jump to that as an immediate solution there. That's, that's and that's a situation know. where more workup, whether it's MRI or bone scan, is um, is an important next step. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, and I, I saw another follow-up question to Schroth. Uh, Schroth is spelt, it's a German word, S-C-H-R-O-T-H. -H. Based on Katarina the Schroth, who was the sort of founder of the whole school of mm -hmm. uh, physical therapy. Out of Germany, Out right. Out of Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a really cool history, actually. Um, all right, let's see what other questions we have. Uh, here we go. If the if a curve has reached 51 degrees, uh, would you say that it's too extreme for therapy? Uh, is tethering an option, or are they truly just a candidate for spinal fusion? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. It's something we talk about a lot. The um, the, the body of evidence that we have about progression sort of says that once the curves hit 45, 50, 55 degrees, scoliosis is much more likely than not. Mm -hmm. But that's not true for 100% of patients. The, 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 the uh, best data that we have comes from large epidemiological studies done from Iowa where um, researchers were able to follow patients for a long period of time. Um, having said that, it doesn't mean that you necessarily need to rush the surgery in every 50 degree curve. I think even more important than the main curve, that 50 degree curve that you're probably talking about, are the compensatory curves. Um, the, the, the smallest, most straightforward uh, surgery that we do is called a selective thoracic fusion. And many times, if you can do that selective thoracic fusion at the right time, the lumbar curve, the lower curve, will spontaneously get better. To me, that's the best possible outcome. And one of the main reasons of doing the surgery is to do the surgery before the lumbar curve progresses. Mm -hmm. When the lumbar curve is already large, that's sometimes a situation where I'm even more comfortable waiting. But today, I um, saw uh, four kids with curves in a 50 degree range, and a couple of them are moving ahead with surgery now, and a couple of them are taking their time. I think the details of the curve and where the curve is and how big the curves are and the rotation 
cosmesis, shoulder imbalance. There's a bunch of things that go into the decision. I would not necessarily use 50 degrees as absolute must-do emergent indication for surgery. That's great. Um, I see a question from Gigi, who is our New Jersey leader. Um, Gigi is getting surgery in 13 days, and we wish her the best of luck. She is in all of our hearts. She has a question. Um, I know she's really worried about it, so she's wondering um, about potential complications. Hi, Gigi, and thanks for all you do. I probably have lots of my patients who are part of your uh, group over there. Um, you're going to do great. Um, the, the huge, huge majority of people in this surgery do amazing. Complication rates are actually very, very low. Our infection rate over the last several years has been well under 1%. Uh, I do a couple hundred of these operations a year and not... Oops. Sorry. We're back. Um, Sorry. Um, not even off. one out of 200 patients gets an infection. The um, uh, rate of having future surgery is really quite low. Anything that you really worry about, like the neurological rate, is exceedingly low. Um, and um, I'm sorry. Oh, my arm is getting tired. Okay. Sorry, everybody. We're back. Sorry. We're. we're uh, <laughs> I'm holding my phone. We had to change our. Uh, computer for some technical reasons, so thanks for putting up with her. Um, the bottom line is um, I expect you to do uh, really, really well, and of course it's an anxiety producing thing. I think everyone realizes that, but you'll, uh, you're you a couple of weeks from having it all behind you, so really wish you the best of luck as well. Yeah. I, I like to tell my girls that um, a lot of the times what we see online are all the scary stories, yeah, right? right? So I had a perfectly normal surgery, and if I didn't have curvy girls, I probably just would have gone on my merry way and not needed to talk about it and share it with anyone because I wasn't going through anything, right? So when we're Googling and when we're looking at online for other people's stories, we're usually finding those scarier stories of, of those 1%, less than 1% complications. Um, so take everything online with a grain of salt, right? Except for this live stream. <laughs> well, no, but I think that Leah's point there is really good. I, th there's so much bad information online, and I think, again, one of the so important roles of Curvy Girls is to act as a filter and really be able to provide real education, real perspectives, real information to people, um, and uh, you guys are doing an amazing job doing that. Thank you. Oh, he's giving us so many compliments. I love it. <laughs> wow, we are getting so many questions in. Let me go to the beginning so I don't miss anything. Let's scroll through some things um my daughter and son have both been di diagnosed is it hereditary um yes there's a very strong hereditary basis for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis mm -hmm. about half of my patients have a mother um, or a sibling with scoliosis um, so we still haven't quite unlocked the genetic basis for it. There's no real genetic test that's really available um, today. Um, but if there's a family history, it makes us think a little bit more about early screening, early detection, and sometimes earlier conservative therapy. If, um, if a, a family member has a curve, I'll sometimes prescribe a brace a little bit earlier or start scoliosis-specific physical therapy earlier. One thing we haven't spoken about is sort of the third pillar of conservative treatment, and that's calcium supplementation. There's amazing evidence that has come out of two really well done studies in Asia, one in China and one in Hong Kong, where they randomized 500 kids and showed that the group of kids showed that most adolescents with scoliosis are vitamin D deficient, and that if you supplement kids with vitamin D, the dosage is 1,000 units, it's the same amount that it's in normal woman's everyday multivitamin. Mm -hmm. If you supplement those kids, rates of progression are dramatically lower. Really? So we supplement every single patient of ours now. When we would sort of look at adequate bracing with a compliance monitor with a, ca a correction to in-brace correction, scoliosis-specific physical therapy, and calcium and vitamin D supplementation as the three pillars for conservative non-operative treatment. Wow, I, I hadn't even heard about that. That's news to me, so that's really cool. And it's easy and free. Yeah. <laughs> Take your vitamin D gummy bear in the morning. Yeah, that's good. Got me in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, instead of an apple a day, right? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's find another question. Um, what does cause scoliosis? Do we, we don't, that's the eye, right? We're learning so much about this, and there's, we're, we're getting closer to understanding of it. This vitamin D part, I think, is going to turn out to be an important thing. Um, vitamin D is um, a vitamin that acts to regulate your bone metabolism. 
it is responsible for osteoporosis. And we're seeing that many adolescents with scoliosis have relative osteoporosis. We think that something, some hereditary factor, which may be a subtle neurological or, or hormonal factor, initiates the scoliosis. But in the subset of kids who are uh, just a bit osteoporotic, meaning low bone density, mm -hmm. um, the, the scoliosis progresses as the bone is not strong enough to stop mm -hmm. progression. That's the role of bracing is to push back. It's the role of uh, physical therapy to create a strong core to uh, maintain um, the, the, the upright position. But we think that the vitamin D may be a real key to progression. So while we don't really understand the full etiology, we're getting much closer. Hmm. That's really cool. I guess we're, we're going to have to call it something besides idiopathic soon, That's right, maybe. exactly, exactly. Um, how did doctors determine which type of brace is right for a person? So um, I have strong feelings about this now that I've uh, been working um, in this field for so long. Um, first of all, the most important thing is in brace correction. The studies that have come out really have shown that if the brace is not correcting the curve while you're wearing it, it's not doing anything. So if we're gonna ask you to wear a brace 16 or 18 or maybe more hours a day, our job is to make sure that your brace is effective. Mm -hmm. It's critical and key to get a correction, to get an x-ray in the brace about six weeks after the initiation of bracing. We aim for a 50 or 60% correction in the brace. Mm -hmm. If you're not getting a 50% correction, go back to your surgeon, your doctor, your orthotist, um, and uh, work harder to do it. We should be able to do that. Um, in the most modern state-of-the-art braces, which I think is a Rego brace, you're getting not only 50% um, correction, but sometimes even up to 100% correction. Right. And the Rego braces have the ability to three-dimensionally derotate the spine, much as you learn to do with Schrott physical therapy. The final part is sort of the sideways or sagittal appearance. We're learning a lot. We're learning that people who are out of balance in the sideways lateral plane are more likely to progress. So a brace is not a brace is not a brace. In my view, a Rego type brace, a Rego Chanel brace, a New York Rego brace has the best chance of stopping progression. And once you're in the right brace, you have to wear it. We were joking earlier on, if I prescribe a really effective blood pressure medicine, but you don't take the blood pressure medicine, your chance of success is zero, and it's the same thing in bracing. In fact, I think every brace should have a compliance monitor built in. Mm -hmm. There are really great compliance monitors now that can tell you, me, your orthotist, your mom, whether or not you're wearing the brace, how many hours a week you're wearing the brace. We know that the two things that dramatically affect your ability to stop progression are good in brace correction and number of hours of brace wear a day. And those are the two sort of key, key, most important things in non-operative management. That's awesome. All right, let's see, what, el what other questions do we have? Can swimming help my scoliosis? Um, swimming and general physical activity is great. It's so important for the developing body, for um, the psyche, um, but it has not been shown to have a specific effect on decreasing curve progression. Um, in fact, people have looked at all exercises and physical therapy in general. Um, in the best um, study, study done um, out of Italy, they did a randomized study of regular physical therapy mm -hmm. and scoliosis-specific physical therapy. Mm -hmm. And the group of kids with regular physical therapy showed curve progression, and the group of kids who had scoliosis physical therapy had their curve get a little bit better. Mm. To me, that's the best evidence that you really need to be doing the right type of physical therapy. Details right. matter in this area, and just like you need to be wearing the right brace, to me, a off-the-shelf standard TLSO is probably not the best brace to use. Right. Just like you need to be doing the right brace, you need to be doing the right type of physical therapy. Right, that makes sense. And then I saw, actually I saw another question about uh, spine core. I don't know where that went. Right, spine core is a brace that um, had some appeal early on because it um, did not have a plastic shell and it had sort of straps that, although a little bit more cumbersome to get into, allowed kids a little bit more flexibility in the mm -hmm. brace. Early on, there was a lot of enthusiasm about it. Unfortunately, a number of studies came out um, over the years showing that the efficacy of the spine core brace was really not where we needed it to be. Um, these days, most people are only using spine core braces in situations where a kid just simply won't use another brace. Mm -hmm. It's pretty controversial whether or not spine core bracing has any role in modern management of scoliosis in my view anyway. That makes sense. Um, while we're on bracing, I see a question. If someone only uses a back brace at night, 
Um, so what do you what do you think about night bracing? Okay, really interesting area. Um, First of all, there's two types of night bracing. There's the overcorrection type of night brace. These things are called Charleston or um, the bending brace. Bending right? I've heard braces. It called, yeah. That's right. There's a Rego N brace standing for nighttime as well. Oh, I haven't heard of that one. Those braces have pretty good data showing efficacy in smaller curves right. and in single curves. Right. There's a large group of curves that those braces are not ideal for. So you really have to get into the details of your curve and what's right for your. Those braces can make. The, the lower curve get worse because mm -hmm. it's only bending one way as opposed to a three-dimensional brace that's correcting both curves. Right. I generally only like those braces for single small curves and kids who are at, at relatively low risk of progression. Mm -hmm. Older kids, kids without a family history, it's not my mainstay for younger kids with larger curves. That makes sense. Um, this is an interesting question. When does the curving of the spine stop? Does it stop when you stop growing? Okay, so. Again, um, we know a lot about curve progression. Curve progression is fastest during the rapid growth spurt that happens around puberty. The best way of assessing that is actually with a hand x-ray. That's called the Sanders score. And I see mm -hmm. some questions yeah, about Sanders here. Yeah, I saw Sanders that question here. up there. So mm -hmm. we know that the traditional ways that we've been looking at um, growth and rapid growth um, are probably not the best ways of doing it. People have been using something called the Rizzer scale. It's not the optimum way of doing it. Using Rizzer, and that's on the hip? And that's on the hip, on okay. the, yeah. And we've done a study here at Columbia showing that using Rizzer makes us make some wrong decisions about when to start and more importantly when to stop racing. Because Rizzer is not accurate, we'll sometimes think a kid is done growing mm -hmm. and take a kid out of the brace. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately those kids can have progression. Mm -hmm. We um, usually brace kids until they're done growing and the best way of assessing that is with hand uh, x-rays, the mm -hmm. so-called Sanders score. And get, get back to the question, curves can um, progress rapidly during growth, but don't progress if the curve is lower than about 35 degrees once kids stop growing. Mm -hmm. So if your curve is lower than about 35 or 40 and you're done growing, mm -hmm. you're at very low risk of progression. Mm -hmm. The problem is, once the curves hit 50, they tend to, to progress even at the end of growth. Mm -hmm. And that's, when, that's why we start to think about surgery for curves in that range. Right. Um, great, let's see what else we have. Uh, oh, this is from uh, one of our senior leaders, she, uh, Jillian. She was our former Toronto leader. She wants to know if you can have an MRI after spinal surgery. Yes, absolutely. Most uh, modern day surgery happens with sort of titanium alloy rods. They're MRI compatible. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no problem with having an MRI. Right around the spine uh, instrumentation for a centimeter or two, you can have some artifacts, some blurriness of the MRI, mm -hmm. but there's no reason that you could not have an MRI at the school of surgery. And that's why we don't go off when we go through metal detectors at the airport, yeah, right? that's exactly right, because it's titanium. Right. Because we get that question all the time. All too. my I friends know, ask me too. that question. Yeah. Right. It's it's funny. Um, all right, let's see what else we have. Um, how does I haven't heard about this. How does growth hormone therapy affect scoliosis? Yeah, um, we have a big center for um, for hormone treatment, endocrine treatment here at Columbia, and I see lots of kids that are on growth hormone. So mm -hmm. growth hormone in itself does not cause scoliosis. It does not cause progression of scoliosis, but it causes growth. And with growth comes the chance of curve progression. It's very rare that we'll stop a kid from being on growth hormone um, because of progression, because we have great non-operative ways of stopping progression, again, with the bracing that we're talking about, mm -hmm. with uh, Rego bracing, with uh, physical therapy. But um, it is something that you have to have a careful conversation about, um, because um, some of the details there get a little tricky. That makes sense. Um, let's go into, I just saw the question, I wanted to admit, lost it. Um, oh, here. Uh, let's talk about sports after surgery. I think I was really active after my surgery. I played golf, was a dancer, and the question here is somebody who plays volleyball. Um, she's always worried that an injury is gonna, you know, cause more trauma. You should really expect to get back to um, all of your activities after surgery, but the details again matter. If you have the most selective surgery, the smallest mm -hmm. surgery, a selective thoracic fusion, most kids don't miss, don't lose any uh, motion or flexibility at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, I operated on um, an extremely high-ranked squash player in the country. She had a selective thoracic fusion, and she went on to be one of the 
top rated squash players in the world awesome. after her surgery. I wouldn't necessarily um, expect that same level of super competitive activity if she had a fusion way down low, mm -hmm. but for the most part, even in recreational dance, sports, gymnastics, people are really able to get back to um, full activities and let get kids get back to almost all activities as early as six weeks after surgery. That's great, that's awesome. I know I know. my surgeon um, told me after my surgery, he said if, you know, nine months down the road, if I can't, you know, uh, what was it? Play, if I can't play golf, if swinging, if swinging a club, you know, messes up my back, then he didn't do a good job with right. his surgery. Oh, like, right. the really fusion good. should be able to... It should not get in the way of anything you want to do. Right, right, that's great. Um, let's see. How often do you see a parent that had scoliosis to the point of requiring surgery and their child ends up with scoliosis as well? Very, very, very often. Again, mm -hmm. about half of my patients have a mom or sister with scoliosis. Right. Um, here at, at Columbia, this was um, one of the very early places that were doing surgery 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I'll often see um, a mom who was treated by, you know, uh, a doctor by the name of Hugo Kime, who started scoliosis surgery in the 1960s, mm -hmm. come in with their daughter. Um, the important point here is that if you have a family history, you need to pay that much more attention at a slightly early, a earlier age, maybe starting around 10 years of age. And in my view, we need to be more um, aggressive about early non-operative care, early scoliosis-specific physical therapy, and maybe even think about using a brace a little bit earlier than normal. Right, right. So that makes yeah. And calcium supplementation. Right. Calcium and That's vitamin cool. D supplementation. I, I'm, I'm excited that I learned something new during there you this go. too. Um, can we talk a little bit about vertebral body tethering, otherwise known as VBT? Okay, anterior vertebral tethering. This is something that I think will someday be a real option in the field. Um, this is a way of trying to uh, take advantage of the growth in the front of the spine, where the growth plates are, and um, to make the curve resolve or go away. Um, the problem is there's always so much enthusiasm about any new technology. And the, the sort of first generation early technology here wasn't really developed for um, teenagers, it wasn't really developed for scoliosis. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of early enthusiasm about it. Unfortunately, the studies now that are coming out two, three, four, five years after the initial tetherings are showing sort of mixed results with a lot of curves re, uh, um, reverting and a lot of the early tethers breaking. Mm -hmm. Nothing bad's happening to the kids, but okay. it looks like many of them are, their curve is coming back. Um, we're really hopeful that new advances in technology, um, new type of implants, stronger tethers, better idea about who to tether when is gonna make a difference. Um, but tethering is still um, on the fringe of what we do. All I do is scoliosis uh, treatment, scoliosis surgery, and I haven't really been willing to jump into tethering yet based on what I know about the outcomes. That makes sense. The other way of looking at it is that the outcome of um, of a selective fusion is so good that um, it's a bit of a gamble to take um, a chance on an experimental treatment. Um, but again, this may change over the next few years as there's innovation in the field. That makes sense. Um, let's talk about chiropractors. Okay, chiropractic, a very common question that I get asked a lot. Um, unfortunately, I, I am totally okay with um, chiropractic. I think that um, in a teenager, there's really no chance of any harm happening. Mm -hmm. um, and it, chiropractic can be really helpful um, with back pain. It's one of the most uh, efficacious treatments for back pain. There's really no evidence that chiropractic positively impacts curve progression. Uh, in other words, I, I would much rather see you spending your time with scoliosis-specific physical therapy that has real evidence backing it um, for curve progression. Um, if it's for back pain, it's a different story. That makes sense. Um, let's see what else we have. What does a menstrual cycle have to do with scoliosis? When we ask when uh, uh, your daughter or, or you had your first period, what we're really trying to get is a understanding, understanding of where you are in your growth. Because we know that peak growth, your rapid growth spurt, is the time that scoliosis progression is most likely, we want to um, be most 
aggressive about doing everything we can to stop progression during that time. It also gives us a sense of when you're going to stop growth. But as you probably recognize, a girl's first period depends on lots of things, including family history, activities, diet. So really the best and most accurate way of looking at growth, again, comes down to the hand, what's called the Sander stage. And we can get a quick hand x-ray and give you a very good sense of what your um, risk of curve progression is. It's really the test that we should be using, the metric that we, we should be using to give you the best advice about starting bracing and stopping bracing. That's great. Um, this is a question I actually don't know much about. Um, and I think, you know, I know a lot of the girls and curvy girls are a lot younger, um, but this is something that our parents ask and something that uh, we worry about much, much later on down the line. But does scoliosis have any effect on during pregnancy and childbirth? And I think that's a question for both people who aren't fused and then who are fused. So maybe it's a two-part question. Yeah, you know, it's actually a great question. And it's, um, <laughs> it's a question now that I am starting to get as I'm older and my patients are coming back, you know, in yeah. childbearing years. So I have right. a number of uh, young adults that have come back to me saying, I'm doing fine, I don't have any back pain, but I'm pregnant or I want to get pregnant or mm -hmm. can I have an epidural? So the answer is it should not affect the, your ability to get pregnant, your ability to um, rear a child, to get an epidural, to have a baby in any way at all. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, there's really no issue there. I, the, the last two things that I tell a patient before I discharge them for care are this will have no effect on any um, and anything around childbearing and remember when you have that child 10 years later they're at higher risk of having scoliosis curve progression and you need to sort of be aware of that mm -hmm. but to answer the question it should have no effect at all uh, in a negative way on childbearing that's great that's good to that's good for everyone to know um, a little bit about a little bit more about pain management for those who have pain after they take their brace off so they haven't had surgery yet what do you recommend? Now, this is a very real issue. You know, the the brace externally controls your core muscles. You know, pushes mm -hmm. on your abdomen and your back muscles, and can make your core muscles a little bit deconditioned. Right. It's really common when kids come out of the brace, therefore, to have some back pain. Mm -hmm. I think that the kids who have been good about Schrott physical therapy mm -hmm. really don't have that problem because they they're they're so good about keeping their core strong, but it's one of the reasons why we recommend slow weaning from the brace, mm. not just to stop the brace cold turkey, but to decrease the number of hours slowly right. so that you don't suddenly see this transition from external support to not having that support. It's not dangerous, it's nothing to worry about, um, and it's something that uh, a little bit of extra physical therapy can often get you through pretty effectively. Cool. Um. I had surgery a month ago, but I still have the hump I used to have before surgery. It's not as bad as it was before surgery, but it's still there. The hump is not necessarily the, the curve that you see on x-ray, but it's the rotation of the spine. Right. We are pretty effective through modern surgical techniques at um, eliminating about 70 or 80 percent of the scoliosis and 70 or 80 percent of the rotational problem. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you should expect a bit of residual scoliosis and a bit of uh, rotational um, asymmetry. Mm -hmm. um, again, the, the, the reason we're doing this is not cosmetic, but I totally understand the issues regarding right. symmetry and body image that are a real part of um, people's concerns about scoliosis. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, what else? Uh, does the unfused part of the spine learn to compensate? So, again, one of the good things about um, getting to a curve at a time where the main so the thoracic curve is big but the lower curve is not is after you fix the main curve the lower curve will usually resolve or go away almost entirely mm -hmm. the lower curve wants to match the main curve mm -hmm. so if the main curve is 50 the lower curve will eventually be 50 and if that happens you have to operate on both curves if the main curve is 50 and the lower curve is still 30 if you fix the main curve to 15, you would expect the lower curve to go to 15. Mm -hmm. And that is, to me, an optimal outcome. And the reason why um, there's a magic window where it's the best possible time to do the surgery. Right. It's the one area where it's probably not worth waiting. Mm -hmm. And that tends to be on a per person basis. Yeah, it's a really, it depends on the details of your curve and where you are and your growth a little bit too. Right. And it's not just the, that we, we, you know, many of us 
really look at the curve, but there are other things that we look at um, that have to do with the amount of deviation, the amount of rotation, um, and the other things about your x-rays that matter. So these decisions really depend on the details of you, your curve, um, and, um, and how you feel about it to some extent as well. That's great. Um, I think this is a good segue of a question. When the spine starts to rotate, what does that mean? Rotation means that um, the curve is not just happening in the, in the view that you see from the front, but mm -hmm. it's turning so that the right side goes more posterior most commonly. It's why you see what sometimes is called a rib prominence, mm -hmm. or people call it a hump. It's part of the progression of scoliosis. It's something that scoliosis-specific physical therapy can improve. It's something that well-done rego bracing can improve. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think a TLSO does that as well. In fact, there's pretty good studies that show that a, a, a regular TLSO does not control the rotation of the spine like a rego brace does. And it's something that effective surgery can really make better. But it's part of scoliosis, and there are good non-operative and also operative, when necessary, ways of improving that. Mm -hmm. Is this something I'm curious about? Will a spine always start to rotate at a certain point, or is it possible for a curve to get really bad, but there is no rotation? Yeah, it's a good question. There, sometimes there's more rotation and sometimes there's less rotation. Mm -hmm. um, when there's less rotation, the curve is often not as visible, not as evident, and right. it's often missed early or picked up later. Mm -hmm. The kids with less rotation often present with bigger curves. I think that's what happened to me. Yeah, and yeah that's because really, mine really was caught common. pretty late. Yeah. The, the, the flip side of it is if there's no rotation at all, it makes us worry a little bit that the curve is not idiopathic because there are some mm -hmm. types of scoliosis that are related to different types of things mm -hmm. that don't happen with any ro um, rotation at all. Mm -hmm. So um, it's something that's important to look at, look at closely, but you're right, many kids present with a 30 or 40 or 50 degree curve because the rotation is not that evident. Right. Um, it looks like we have a shout out. Have you ever worked with Dr. Lenke at Columbia? Lenke is uh, my partner and we work together a couple <laughs> times a week and uh, he's, a, he's a great surgeon and has done a lot uh, in the field of scoliosis, so you're in good hands. That's awesome. Um, I know we're getting a lot of questions, and just so you know, if we haven't answered your question um, and you joined late, we might have answered it earlier on. Um, once this video is done, it'll be up on our page so you guys can watch it in full. Just so you know, we at the beginning, we addressed a lot about Schroth, so I definitely highly recommend going back to uh, watch that those questions. Um, here's a new question. Are people with asthma condition in a greater risk during operation? Um, generally speaking, everyday asthma doesn't increase the risk of surgery. It's something that does need to be managed. There's often in the operating room, the anesthesiologist will give the equivalent of an inhaler to people with mm -hmm. um, asthma, but it should not uh, really change the surgery in any way. Mm -hmm. um, new question again. When can you state affirmatively that a kid is done growing? So again, the best way of looking at growth um, initiation, right, right. growth maximum velocity and growth cessation has to do with the hand. Mm -hmm. It turns out that your hand x-rays um, will show growth plates at the tips of your fingers, here, 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 and then in the wrist. Oh, that's really cool. Your, I only knew about the wrist one, so I didn't know about the fingers. And they all, your, your growth plates all close at different times uh -huh. from distal to proximal. Okay. So if your growth plates are just closing here, you're mm -hmm. not yet in your peak growth. Uh -huh. If your growth plates are closing here, you're in peak growth. Once these growth plates close, there's no chance of growth left any, anywhere in your body. Wow. They're among okay. the last growth plates in your body to close. So that's why this is really the best way to make these decisions. Mm -hmm. A girl can still have sniffing growth two years after a girl has her period, although it's right. not normal, common, it happens. Mm -hmm. So I'd much rather see you and your doctors using your hand x-ray to guide decision making than uh, things like when a girl first has her period or, or the RIS are signed for that matter. That's great. And that tends to happen earlier for girls and boys, right? Absolutely. That's good. Um, is there anything that we haven't covered here that you like to talk about? I think that the key things are um, the right type of bracing and to me a three-dimensional rego brace, a brace with a compliance monitor and attention to in-brace correction in all planes. Are, are the most important things. Mm -hmm. Compliance in the brace. 
we're, we're, we're getting a sense for how much kids need to wear the brace. We know the answer is not 24 hours. Mm -hmm. It's also probably not 12 hours. Right. Um, I, I think that we're going to find that the dose, if you will, of bracing has to do with your risk of progression. Mm -hmm. So I'll tend to ask my patients to wear the brace more um, if they're younger at higher risk of progression and maybe be a little bit more um, lenient in lower risk kids. Mm -hmm. So the type of brace, the amount of bracing, scoliosis specific physical therapy, again, studies done here at Columbia show dramatic um, decreases in curve progression in the groups of kids who are compliant. And then the third pillar is um, vitamin D and calcium supplementation. I think um, if you're doing all of those things, there's this promise that we can really dramatically improve outcomes in this area. In fact, one of the um, concepts that we want to um, spread is this thing about this bracelet that we're both wearing, this green bracelet, which is, um, there you go, um, <laughs> Cure AIS. I think that with real careful attention to um, the details of conservative non-operative management in a lot of situations where scoliosis would otherwise progress, we may essentially be able to cure it. I know for sure that even if we can't stop every curve from progression, we can do a lot better than we've done in the past. Right. Can we kind of, I mean, can you list like what you, what those risk factors are, like what you are that you, that you, kind, of, you kind of like add up? So. Uh, the, the things that I think about um, with regard to risk are family history. Mm -hmm. There are kids where I've operated on three sisters in the family. Wow. That's probably a different type of scoliosis, mm -hmm. and maybe that's a scoliosis that won't be amenable even to the best conservative treatment that we have, mm -hmm. although we always try. Um, but the most important thing probably is age at onset. Mm -hmm. And we know that in a kid who is really young early in their growth, they're at much, much higher chance of progression than the kid who presents later on. Mm -hmm. um, it's why we should need to be even more aggressive earlier in that group of kids. Um, finally, we have an obligation to make sure that these curves are all idiopathic. Um, and um, uh, not uncommonly, I'll diagnose another cause of scoliosis in my teenage patients. That can be anything um, from a, a soft a connective tissue thing that mm -hmm. makes the, uh, that's related to increased flexibility to a difference in the anatomy of the spinal cord that we um, pick up during an MRI. So I think we need to prove that AIS, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, is truly idiopathic. That's great. Um, I saw a few questions coming in about um, x-ray and, and radiation exposure, and can we just kind of touch upon that? Yeah, it's something that um, is a particularly on my mind for, for my group of kids with early onset uh, scoliosis. About half of my patients are teenagers with scoliosis, mm -hmm. and about half are kids less than eight years of age. Right. It's not that uncommon to have scoliosis for a number of reasons earlier on, and if you think about it, a kid who comes to see me at two years of age mm -hmm. is going to have lots of x-rays over the course of their life. Hot, yeah. It's the reason why EOS, mm -hmm. the, the new generation of x-ray, um, uh, promises such an advantage. Mm -hmm. EOS x-rays have almost no radiation um, exposure. Now the truth is, the long-term studies of even traditional x-ray don't show a real difference in risk over uh, term, but it just makes sense that if you're going to have radiation exposure right. three times a year during your period of rapid growth, it'd be better to avoid that. Right. So um, to me, I really think it's important to find a place that has EOS x-rays. Mm -hmm. And that's EOS, E-O-S. E-O-S. All capital. That's right. Um, that's another thing that's coming over from Europe to us. That's right. It was a Nobel Prize winning uh, oh, really? yeah, technology. That. That's um, awesome. And it's hard. It's a million dollar machine that you know, has to be uh, you know, purchased and you need a whole room to do it. But I think it's really worth it. It's part of what I consider best practice for scoliosis. That's awesome. Um, this is an interesting question. And um, how can we get the word out? Is it not mandatory to screen in all states? Uh, this is um, something that's close to my heart. So. At one point, the United States Medicine, Preventive Medicine Task Force felt that there was not enough evidence that bracing works mm -hmm. to mandate school screening. They wrote a paper. Uh, our organization, the Scoliosis Research Society, countered this in an article that I wrote saying that we did not agree. Um, and in fact, once the brace study came out that convincingly showed that if you brace kids early, they're much less likely to progress. Um, there's been a wide-scale recognition that early screening is important. Um, the USPTF has not come along yet to change those guidelines, mm -hmm. so states are not obligated to screen. I think it's a little bit of a shame because 
early detection um, means less likely progression um, with the right type of non-operative conservative uh, treatment. Um, screening doesn't have to be as part of a formal program. It could be in, the, in your pediatrician's office, or it could be just looking at your kid closely for shoulder asymmetry and a difference in uh, scapular or the, uh, the shoulder blades, a difference in the, the flank crease. Um, so if you see a difference, just get to your doctor. Right. That's good. That's great information. Uh, all right. It's been it's been close to an hour. I don't want to keep you too late. He's got four boys to get home yes, to. Yes, that's right. <laughs> There's lots of information on my website, which is pediatricscoliosissurgery.com. Mm -hmm. Curvy Girls is probably the best source of information in the universe for oh. the adequate, uh, that the appropriate management of kids with scoliosis. So it's been a real pleasure. I really appreciate you inviting me, Leah. Thank you so much. And again, we're hoping to do this more often. We're looking to do this about once a month, bringing in different people. Um, so maybe a Shroth therapist next time. Um, hopefully get Allison Gerber, the author of Bray soon. And again, if you didn't hear your question answered, we've been going for about an hour. So I know we talked a lot about Schroth in the beginning and a lot about, we talked about um, scoliosis for during pregnancy and we talked about screenings and tons of different things. So definitely go back. This video will be available for you to view on our page moving forward. Um, thank you everybody so much for tuning in. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank Be you, Dr. Vitaly. Best of luck in your journey. <laughs> thank you. Bye.